dear brothers and sisters, dear friends, welcome to the third presentation in the series of presentations in the missionary training program offered in the East Canadian Field Conference. We are happy that you join us today for this session, and we trust that you will be blessed and learn more about the content of the message for this time and the ways how we can communicate it in an effective way so that souls would learn the present truth and be blessed by it. We are here today to learn about the core message that God has entrusted to his Seventh-day Adventist people to communicate to the world before the second coming of Christ. And we are doing this series to enable our members and friends to know how to reach to the world and how to help the world to be saved. This is why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save the world. And we are here as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We are sent out with a great commission to reach the world with a saving message for this time. So before we go into the first presentation, I would like to offer a very short prayer. Let us pray. Most loving and gracious Father, we thank you for giving us another opportunity to preach the Holy Word. May thy Holy Spirit guide us as we open the Word and as we present the truths, sacred and precious truths for this time. May this truth penetrate the darkness of this world and may we all learn how to be efficient missionaries for you. Lord, bless the viewers Bless all those who are engaging in this important work. Forgive us our sins. We ask and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So the title, my topic for today is the message for the judgment hour. So what shall we be talking about? We will be talking about the book of Revelation, Revelation of Jesus Christ. When we approach the book of Revelation, we can go into the systematic study of verse by verse, or we can simply get a larger picture. Today, we will actually be going that second way. We will be looking at the central truths in the center of the book of Revelation. But before I go into that book, I'd like to simply give you a story. I do not know whether you ever have had experience of being in an airplane and in a kind of a crisis. It happened to me once. I was traveling to Roanoke, Virginia, and there was uh, quite a turbulence in the air. It was a very strong wind. And the airplane could not land in uh, Roanoke, so uh, we were directed to Greensboro in North Carolina. But the wind was not abating. It was very strong. And then when we came to Greensboro, the plane could not land because the wind was still very strong. So we were simply cruising in the air, circling around. And I was sitting in the rear part of the, of the airplane, in the rear seats. And the, uh, the, the plane, especially that part of the airplane, was shaking very much. It was shaking so much that I became no nauseated. And I, I, I wanted to vomit. It was so difficult. And I was even afraid that, that something might happen to the plane. I was praying to God that the plane, uh, the plane would land as soon as possible. And ultimately, it landed. I have never had such an experience in my life. But it taught me a lesson that when you are traveling, things can happen. And I'd like to share with you a story. It's a real-life story that you probably have heard about. It happened in 2009. Uh, January 15 to be more accurate and it's uh, today known as the most successful ditching in aviation history this is by National Transportation and Safety Board the landing in Hudson River what happened actually the US Air Flight 1549 shortly after takeoff simply struck a flock of geese and uh, some geese got into the engines and both engines on the airplane, it was Airbus A320, simply shut down. They did not operate. The pilot didn't have much options. So this is a hero of Hudson, Captain Chesley Sullenberger, Sully. Uh, at that time, he was 50 year, 58 years old with 40 years of flying experience. 
And what uh, the captain did, he communicated with the control towers. He, did, he could not reach any nearby airport, and he made a decision to land the airplane into the Hudson River in New York City. So this was an amazing feat. So interestingly, uh, Captain Sullenberger was also uh, gliding. He had a license in gliding, gliders. And he knew how to even a large passenger aircraft bring safely to the water you know, in the river. And ultimately, 155 passengers were in the plane. None of them, them perished. All were rescued. Just one lady, I think she had two broken legs, but everyone safe and sound. They were rescued, taken off. Now, this was an amazing experience for people who survived. Um, I have read the experiences and the stories, what they recounted. One lady said this was the best day in my life because I learned to value life. I learned to value my family members and friends because I was sending the message to my husband, sending a last greeting. And he later erased that greeting, said I don't want to be reminded of that. But you see, the point is here, there was a capable skillful, experienced captain in the airplane behind the commands who knew how to land the plane in an emergency situation. And the death was, the passenger said, we were afraid of dying on, in the air on the plane, and we were later on afraid of dying in the plane on the river when we were in the, on the water. One lady said the water was waist deep. We were deep, uh, waist deep in the water, and we were thinking, uh, we are drowning. We will be dying. But somehow, miraculously, they survived. I would propose, brothers and sisters, that we in this world right now are in the plane that is going to crash. And we need in to be in the safe hands right now. We need someone who is very skillful, very reliable, very wise to land us safely. And we propose that that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we see in this world there are so many troubles. We are still in this pandemic, it is slowly uh, slowing down, but we are not completely out of this crisis. So it caused a lot of suffering, a lot of death, even in our communities here in Canada. So a problem that we still deal with. So there is a war, a war in Ukraine right now, war in other parts of the world. Many people were thinking there will be no more war and tank battles <coughs> and uh, battles in the cities, European cities, in this century, like it was in the last century. But uh, the tanks are rolling through the streets. Thousands of people are dying. Buildings are being destroyed. People are being killed, displaced, mi migrating, many refugees. Very sad images <coughs> of families, you know, separated. Children are uh, t taken or uh, left alone. So there are very, very tragic scenes in the world. And also there is a danger of nuclear confrontation and nuclear war, which could really cause death and suffering of millions of people. Our planet is really in trouble. Then we are having natural disasters, disastrous winds like tornadoes, hurricanes. These are images from Czech Republic. Uh, and then we are having flooding uh, around the world, f wildfires, thousands of acres are burned down. There are droughts. Then there is this violence, social unrest, social injustice, confrontations, and the crimes. Just yesterday, actually today, as I was traveling, I heard about two uh, gun violences, one here in Toronto on Widermere Street, another one yesterday in Brampton. Two young men killed. Still perpetrators not found. Just in one day, two people died in Toronto, greater Toronto area. And then there is a sexual immor immorality, divorce, and, and all kind of uh, things that are not in harmony with the law of God. And this is the world in which we live, world that is in trouble, world that is moving in the wrong direction. But at this time, when we see so many problems in the world, God has a message for this time. And where do you think this message is? It is in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. God has a message of hope, of bright future for the world, for those who have God as their captain in the airplane. 
So this message is going to all parts of the world, giving hope to people who are choosing Jesus Christ. And the book of Revelation is the book. So there is a hope in that book. I don't want to deceive you. I want to tell you the book of Revelation also contains messages of natural, about natural disasters, about wars, even about economic sanctions that people will not be able to buy or sell except under certain conditions, even about the death decree. But ultimately, in spite of all this ungodliness, injustice, perversion, God will win the great controversy, the great war. God has a message of hope, and he is giving us this message in that book of Revelation. That message that is proclaimed today, right now, as I speak at this place, this message is going throughout the whole world, and we would like to share this message. So I'd like to now tell you that this is not the first time that we present such a message in a critical time of Earth's history. Even in the spiritual prophecy, we are told which truths we should proclaim at this hour. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. But the sub such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with 2,300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, this is the third angel's message. These truths are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and show what our present position is, establish the faith of the doubting, and give certainty to the glorious future. These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which the messengers should dwell. This is in early writings, page 63. So Seventh-day Adventists, we are called in a special way to proclaim a message for this hour of Earth's history, the last message of mercy by which God calls the world to repentance, offering hope, offering salvation. And this is why we speak this message. But God always sends a message to prepare his people for major worldwide events which affect their eternal destiny. If we study the history, the past, the, the, the plan of salvation, God never does anything major in the world affairs without sending a warning, a message through his servants, the prophets. So let's see in the history how did God act or how did he work. So the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are two important books that simply provide us with a panoramic view of the world history as a prophecy. So from the time of Daniel and then John in the first century of uh, this uh, era, we have the prophecies reaching to the very end of the world where God has prophesied what will take place. So loving God invites people to be saved before the coming calamity and these prophecies are in the book of revelation so let us look first at the old world ancient world where when god called a messenger by the name noah and entrusted him gave him a commission to preach a message about the coming flood that will take place about 120 years from that time and he, god commanded him to build the ark why was it necessary uh, how was the world in Noah's time? We read in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and verse 11. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The earth was also corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Brothers and sisters, do we see violence in the world in which we live right now? Do we see people being wicked, departing from God's ways, not seeking God, and their thoughts, their imaginations, evil continually. Isn't the world in which we live similar to that antediluvian world? But God sent a message, and he commissioned a messenger to invite people to be saved, to build an ark. In that ark, whoever would not get in that ark would be lost. So, and I'm sure that God wanted many people to be saved at that time, but people rejected the message of mercy. Only Noah and his family accepted the call, invitation, and were saved in the ark. But I believe that God wa wanted probably to be more than one ark, to save, save thousands of people, but people rejected the message. And if God sent a message in Noah's time, before the flood, 
don't you think that God would send another message, important message before this, uh, the end of the world? We believe it so. And this is why we preach this message. Now, I, will, I could mention another case, for example, Joseph in Egypt. There will be famine in Egypt. This was a major empire, and there would be famine in the Middle East. God, there will be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So God commissioned Joseph, gave him a dream, and may, he made wise plans to make provisions for these years of famine. But then we, another major case is John the Baptist. Before the first coming of Jesus Christ to this earth, God raised a messenger. He was called by God. Even his birth was announced by an angel of God, a great angel who came and announced. And John was born and he lived a humble life and he delivered a very special message before the first coming of Christ, calling people to repentance. And that prepared the way for the first coming of Christ. So don't you think that before the second coming of Christ, God will have a special message for this time? In Amos 3, 7, we are told, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So the book of Revelation is the book that contains these secrets for our time. And it's, don't you think it's important today to study the book of Revelation and to find prophecies for our time? I believe so. So this is why we will be studying today this amazing book. So God's end time message is contained in the book of Revelation. Now, when we study today, we will be studying the chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. Everything before chapter 14 leads to that chapter, and everything after chapter 14 of Revelation simply is uh, unpacked or uh, leading. Chapter 14 leads us into these other chapters. There are simply natural connection, natural continuance of what is in chapter 14. So chapter 14 of Revelation contains a very important message. And I'd like to share this message with you because God sends this message to this world before second coming of Christ to warn the world. This is a loving message. Let me read Revelation 14, uh, verses, verses 4 and on. Before I go on, I'd like to tell you that in chapter uh, 14, we will have uh, three parts and we will explain how they operate. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having ev the everlasting gospel. So this is to preach unto them that dwell on earth, the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this is a universal message. What does he see? I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Do you see, brethren, this message goes to the remotest corners of the world, to the jungles, to the large cities, to every nation, every tongue, every kindred, to every religion. It goes to the Buddhist, it goes to the Hindus, it goes to the atheists, it goes to the Christians. This message goes in the whole world. Even when I'm speaking here in this humble chapel here in Toronto, this message can go to the whole world through internet, through media, through printed word, through radio, television. Message goes in the world. There are many people who are getting this message through books, through literature, door to door. This is God's last message of mercy that goes in the whole world. Even in the most totalitarian regimes, or most closed societies, God will open the way and this message will enter in. So what event does this message prepare the world for? And Revelation 14 answers that question. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14 has three parts. Remember that. In the first five verses, we are having the people, people who are gathered, who are redeemed by Jesus Christ and through this message. These are 144,000. Then we are having, from verses 6 to 12, we are having these three messages. Messages that simply God sends to the world. And then the last part of chapter 14 is the event for which the messages are prepared. And this is, as we will see, the second coming of Lord Jesus Christ. So as I mentioned, the first five verses describe those who are redeemed, 144,000 of the sea of glass. And then I will skip and go to the last part. After the messages are delivered, what happens? 
We read Revelation 14, verses 14 to 16. For the time is come for thee to reap. Uh, just a moment. Uh, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, uh, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for the thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now when we are looking at this text, we may ask a question, who is this one riding on the cloud, white cloud? Those who study the Bible know that this is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is coming in glory. This is his second coming to this world. He is surrounded by all heavenly angels. He is coming to this earth as a king of kings and lord of lords. He has a golden crown on his head. He has a royal scepter and he has a sickle and he's coming to harvest, to harvest this earth. Now, let me ask the question, what does the harvest represent or mean symbolically in the book of Revelation? Now, we don't have to guess what the harvest means. We simply find explanation in the book of in the, in the parables of Jesus Christ. Christ spoke about harvest, about sowing and harvesting. And this is in chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew. And then he was saying how certain man sows you know, good seed and then seed falls in the ground and grows. But then you know, his servants notice that there, is a, there are tares together with the wheat and they wanted to pluck out the tares. But these masters said, no, don't pluck the tares now leave it until the harvest. And then we read verse, we read verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil who sowed the tares. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So see, what is the harvest in the book of Revelation is the end of the world, the end of this age. So when Jesus comes, this is the end of the world, and he comes to harvest. So why is this important? Because second coming of Jesus Christ will be a glorious event. This will end the misery of this world. This will end the reign of sin, a reign of death, persecution, suffering, disease. And he will usher in a new age, a glorious age. Eternity comes with Jesus Christ. But as Jesus comes, this is important. The message has to be given to this world to call people to repentance, to turn to God, to turn from evil ways. And this is why we have these special messages in Revelation in the middle part of the book 14 from verses 6 to 12. And now I will read. I believe that we have to closely look at these messages. There are three angels, and these angels symbolize people of God who are preaching these messages, declaring them in the whole world. We read verse 6 in Revelation 14. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Now, I'd like to sp spend with you a few moments thinking about everlasting gospel. What is this everlasting gospel? This uh, presentation is rather instructional, evangelistic preaching, that we understand what is in these three angels' messages? What is the main content? What we should preach to people? And please note that everlasting gospel is the first thing that we preach. Why it's called everlasting gospel? What is gospel? Let me share with you Apostle Paul, the great preacher of the gospel. He told us what is the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 5, verses 3 and 4, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what is the gospel? You see, gospel is here in the nutshell. Even Bible scholars agree that this is probably one of the earliest records, written records about the content of the gospel, what gospel is. So Christ died for our sins. Christ was buried Christ rose again. What does it mean that Christ died for our sins? 
You and I, brother and sister, dear friend, with all our sins and our sinful lives, we come to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus became a man for us. He is also, he was also a God. And he simply lived here on this earth and took our place as a holy being. He was crucified. He was put on the cross. He loved us so much. And when we come to God in the name of Jesus and accept Jesus, his perfect life record stands in our place. And we are treated as he deserved to be treated. And he was treated as we deserve to be treated. So we exchange the place. This is the gospel. He died for us. We call it substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. This was an awful death. This was an awful suffering. He took upon himself our sins. Why we have a problem today, why we have depression, why we have suicide, because people have no hope. People have no future. And this is why God, too, because people are depressed, the guilt weighs heavily on people's minds, on people's souls, people's hearts. And Jesus came. He came to take that guilt away from us. And this is the gospel. When we come to Jesus Christ and say, God, I, have, I deserve nothing but death, but thy son gave his life for me, and I believe in him, I believe, I trust in his merits, in your grace, then this perfect record of Jesus Christ is attributed to me, accounted to me, and I stand before God as I have never sinned. This is Jesus died for our sins. And this is the everlasting gospel. In 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that you believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. See how John talks with confidence. We know that we have that you may know that you have eternal life. So in Jesus Christ is life eternal. We receive it as a gift. And we may know it. God gives us assurance. And if we walk humbly with him from day to day, we keep this holy life, new life, eternal life, in the name of Jesus. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world. God loved you and me. He still loves us. That he gave us his only begotten son. He gave him for each one of us. He gave him for the whole world. This is God's love. This is the message that Jesus himself preached to Nicodemus. You know, who was a prominent Jewish leader and scholar. And he came one night to talk to Jesus. But Jesus brought him to this point that he has to look up to the cross of Jesus as he said to that serpent, uh, brazen serpent that Moses put on the, on the pole. And whoever would look with a look of faith, he would not die, but he would live. This is the gospel. Second point, Christ lived a perfect life. To qualify to be our substitute, to pay for our guilt, for our sins, Jesus had to be perfect, sinless being. And throughout his life, Jesus walked in perfect conformity to God's law, to God's will. He loved to do the will of his Father. He was healing the sick. He was uh, forgiving sins to people. He was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And Jesus, until the very last moment, he lived that life of perfect obedience, perfect surrender. And we can have that life. That's a good news. Not only that we can be forgiven, but that we can be also victorious. Because we will see in a moment that those who follow the Lamb Jesus Christ, these 144,000, they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That faith that kept Jesus always close to his Father in perfect obedience and surrender to his will. This is, and in, in, God, in, in Revelation, in chapter 2 and 3, Jesus sent letters to the churches, seven churches. In every letter ends, he that overcometh, I will give him this or that or that. You can eat of the tree of life. You can sit on my throne. This is he who overcomes as I have overcome. Jesus overcame. He had a perfect life. And he offers this as a gift to us. That's a good news. This is the gospel. So Christ per Christ's perfect life record is put in place of the sinful records of all who accept him. All who accept Christ by faith can have the same victorious faith which Jesus had. All Christians who live by faith can be victorious 
to him that overcometh, we are told. And then the third point, Christ rose from the dead. Christian world recently celebrated Easter. It's not biblically mandated, but definitely the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the major, is the most important event in the whole history of the world. Jesus conquered death. He rose from the dead. If you go to Buddhism, what do you get there? What is the ultimate purpose of life? It's nirvana. When you die, that you don't come back, you know, in this cycle of life, but that you simply merge with, you know, one, with eternity. You simply lose your consciousness, your individuality, and you simply become unconscious of everything. In Christianity, we have Jesus Christ. No one has conquered death. No one that we know in history claims any religious leader, but Jesus Christ said, I am resurrection and life. We have an uh, image here of Mary, who saw him on this Sunday morning early. She saw the resurrected Lord, and she was amazed. This is a living Savior that we have. He's alive. He is our representative in heaven. He ascended to heaven to his Father, and he is the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. You know, the great leaders of this world, you can name Alexander the Great, you can go to Julius Caesar, you can go to Napoleon, you can go to anyone, even the best of them. People are buried and dead. They are not alive. But Jesus Christ is alive. He is our Lord. He is our high priest in heavenly sanctuary. He is mediating on our behalf. And then we are told, when will Jesus come? How about this gospel, Matthew 24, 14? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Brothers and sisters, this is a good news. God loves the world. He wants this gospel to go in the whole world, to be preached to every creature, every human being, every man, every woman, every child, and especially this everlasting gospel that we have in three angels' messages, complete gospel all aspects of what Jesus has accomplished and done for us. This is the everlasting gospel. But in these three angels' messages, we will see that God also reminds the world of some long-neglected truths that should be restored. And we will be talking about these truths. So let's see, what is this, what, are the, what is Revelation's urgent end-time message? First thing, Besides, when we go beyond everlasting gospel, we see that God also commands people to obey him. Because it's not enough to profess that we believe in God, that we accept Jesus Christ. We need to demonstrate our faith by our obedience. And this is why we are told in Revelation 14, 7, first angel cries, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. What does it mean to fear God? Some people have told me, oh, I'm frightened when I hear about this word or this phrase, fear God. But please understand, when we talk about this expression, fear God, this doesn't mean that we are frightened like over some kind of authoritarian uh, tyrant who would uh, simply punish and... Uh, uh, abuse his subjects. No, this word in Greek language also has, because every word has a range of meanings. One of the meanings of the word here is the deepest awe, reverence, respect for God, which leads us to a desire to obey and the respected person. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, let us hear biblical definition. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. Proverbs 3, 1. My son, forget not my law, let, but let thine heart keep my commandments. What do you think? Has the world forgotten the law of God today? I would say so. Not many people are willing. People say, oh, the law is restricting our freedom, our liberties. But this is very wrong. Look what the wisest man, Solomon, said in the, in, to his son. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. He's not saying or just intellectually, but let this law be in your heart, that you understand 
that this law that I want to give you, these rules for life, are for your freedom. They will ensure, guarantee your freedom. This is why God calls us to this uh, reverent uh, obedience, that we love him. And this is also expressed in, the, uh, this is a quality of the people who follow God. And here in uh, verse 12, we have a very well-known text. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the characteristic of the saints in the last days. They keep the commandments of God, all ten commandments, and they have the faith of Jesus, as we have mentioned a moment ago. So this is who God's remnant people are. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is in John 14, 15. And then we go further Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. So what does it mean to give glory to God? Uh, so this is important to uh, understand. Giving glory to God, to glorify God, means to honor him in our lifestyle. There are different ways how we can give glory to God. Uh, God's glory is in his name, which is his character, and this is another aspect. However, for um, an important aspect of glorifying God is also that in our body, our mind, our, our soul, our body would be completely God's vessel that he can use for his honor and glory. So in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, we are told, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So how do you give glory to God? Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever else you do, you give glory to God. You see, God created us to be his temple. God always wanted to dwell in a human being. So God wants us to be dedicated to him. What we put in our mouth, what we watch with our eyes, what we hear, what we read, what we speak, everything should be to the glory of God. If I smoke cigarettes, can I give glory to God? Actually, if you look at, at the lungs of a heavy smoker or per per people who smoke for many years, you can see it's full of tar. And these very sensitive alveoles in the, our lungs where oxygen is, you know, uh, uh, re re exchanged and uh, carbon dioxide. You know, we, we just now had recently this COVID and many people have had problems with the respiratory system and with breathing. And then when we look into this, how delicate is the is mechanism? But if we are destroying our body, can we give glory to God? Or if we are drinking intoxic intoxicating drinks, can we glorify God if our mind is altered, if we cannot even clear think clearly, is this giving glory to God? So you see, this is why Bible tells us, invites us to give glory to God in our bodies, whatever we do. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which is your worship. This is the way how you worship God. You give him glory in your body, whatever you do. It's your living sacrifice. And this is very important. We call this aspect a, as a, we call it a health reform. This is the, the right hand of three angels' messages. So you see, God calls people to, re to restoration, to the obedience to the laws of health that he established, a proper diet, proper lifestyle. This is giving glory to God. So, and then we have a worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is quite interesting in the first angel's message. Wh who is this message calling us to worship? The one who created heaven and earth sees in the fountains of waters, the creator of heaven and the earth. How appropriate is this message for this time when we have a prevailing dominant worldview of the origin of this world, evolutionary science. There is no God, there is no creator. Simply random chains, blind force, and then gradual development and evo evolution and so on, which is directly contrary to the account of the Bible that the infinitely wise designer creator created human beings and everything what we see. And see, this is a dominant worldview in universities, in scientific institutions, and this is how they interpret the world. 
So there is an intelligent designer who created the whole show, how well-known apologist uh, John Lennox says, God did not, God is, he says, God is not the God of the gaps. God is the creator of the whole show. He created the laws of nature. He put everything in place. We see how finely tuned is this universe. We see infinite wisdom, mathematical precision. So God is behind the whole thing. This is the God whom we serve. And you see, interestingly, when the three angels' messages came in from 1840s onward, at the same time, Satan planted this pernicious uh, theory of evolution that through Charles Darwin and Origin of Species came into existence. So Satan is combating three angels' messages, but God is calling us back to worship God the Creator. So God gave us meaning and purpose. You are not random, a, a random combination of some chromosomes and genes. No, God created you. You are unique in the world. There is no other person like you with all these features and all this identity that you have. So God wants us to have a meaning and purpose. We have our heavenly parent who brought us into existence. From the minutest atoms to grandest galaxies, we see the fingerprints of the Creator. And this is the message that we give to the world. God formed the man from the dust of the ground. The biblical record about creation tells us that God spoke and brought everything into existence. But when it came to man, God simply, like a sculpture, sculptor, he fashioned, he formed the man from the dust of the earth. So God gave us a personal touch because we are made in God's image. And this is the message. So why is God worthy of worship? Why we worship God? Look at this text, Revelation 4, 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We can worship only the being who is the creator, no one else. People who do not worship God, they will worship something else. They will worship man. They are putting man in God's place, but God calls us to worship him. He always distinguished himself from false gods and idols in the Old Testament times because he said, these idols are man-made or there are celestial objects like sun and moon and so on which God created. But you don't worship these things. You worship the one who made everything, who made the whole show. And then when God created this whole world, God made a monument, a, a memorial in time that commemorates he, this great uh, creative work and that points us to God who is the creator. We call this memorial the seventh day Sabbath. In the uh, six days of creation, God finished everything and he rested the seventh day and he blessed and sanctified, hallowed this day. This is the memorial in time that we observe and keep as pointing us always to our God who is our creator and our redeemer. But you see, in the three angels' messages, we have a conflict. We have a confrontation because between worshiping God, worshiping proper worship creator, and worshiping the beast. And so this is coming out in verse 9 of the book of Revelation. So we have in these messages, obey God, glorify God, worship God. So this is important to understand in this so first angel's message, we will summarize. What are we supposed to be doing? This is what the message tells us, what we should be doing, you know. Fear God, give glory to him. Why we are supposed to do it? We are supposed because God is the creator. And why is it so vitally important? Because we are living in the hour of his judgment. This is what we will be focusing on now. Because then says in Revelation 14, 7, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Not it will come or has come in the past. No, it's right now. Has come right now. We are living in the hour of judgment. What does it mean? In Revelation 22, 12, we are told the following. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of heaven at the end of the age with all his angels, he is bringing the reward. What does it mean? This means that he brings reward that must be some kind of judicial determination who is worthy to receive reward and who will receive the punishment. So Christ brings judgment. So judgment must take place before the second coming of Christ that we, that, that 
Jesus could bring the reward. So you see, in the world in which we live right now, there is a lot of injustice, a lot of uh, unfairness, and we experience in this, in this world, but God will set all things right. God will address or redress all injustices. In Revelation 16, 7, we are told, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. You see, atheistic philosophers, they don't have an answer to the question, if there is no God, if there is no uh, celestial justice, superior justice than what is here on earth, we have a justice system, but it is very poor and very poorly administered in many ways. Many people who have com committed terrible crimes have never received justice in this earl, in, on this earth, and they died in peace. And their crimes cry to heaven for justice. And atheists, they cannot answer that question. So justice cannot be satisfied on the atheistic worldview. But biblical worldview tells us that there is someone in the universe who will administer justice. People will receive what they have deserved. And God is just, we are told here, who administers that justice. Why is the hour of judgment so important? In Revelation 22, verse 11, we are told, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. At some point in time, in not so distant future, judgment in heaven will come to the end. And simply, Jesus will stop his work as a high priest, and he will simply execute the judgment. So this is why today we have to make a choice. We have to simply choose Jesus Christ as our advocate, and that he would plead our case. Otherwise, we will have to come to judgment without an advocate, in, with our guilt, with our guilty garment, filthy garment, and receive what we have deserved. Now is the time to make the choice. Now is the time to choose Jesus Christ before it will be too late, and then many people will be. And this is why these three angels are flying throughout the whole world, calling people, warning them, please make peace with God. The hour of judgment is right now going on. And in the first angel's message, we have these precious truths that are simply expressed. It's a call to accept the everlasting gospel. It's a good news, as we explain. It's a call to loving obedience, reverence. Then what else? To give glory to God in totality in all our, our lives. It's a call to worship our loving creator and to live in harmony with the commands of that creator. And it's an urgent call to live godly lives in the light of earth's final judgment. So these are the important points in the first angel's message. So when we preach this message, we talk about the gospel, everlasting gospel first. We talk about loving obedience is as a response to that work that God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Then we give glory to God. We give him our complete body, our complete being on the, as a living sacrifice. And then we worship the loving creator and keep all his commandments, including the seventh day Sabbath. And ultimately, we live a godly life because we live in a special hour, hour of judgment in this world. But then the second angel flies. And the second angel is warning us about false worship. Because in the first angel's message, we have truth brought out. What is the truth for this hour? Second angel's message gives us, reveals the error and warns about error. Let's read the second angel's message. Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city. So Babylon is an ancient city that was in ruins at the time of John, a revelator, John who was on Patmos. Babylon was destroyed. So Babylon is a symbolic city in the book of Revelation. It has a symbolic meaning. It has a connection with the ancient Babylon that was the seat of false worship. And that, but now we are talking about spiritual Babylon. And this spiritual Babylon is also represented with a woman who is a harlot and who has a cup in which there is a wine of her fornication. And this represents false teachings, false doctrines that are opposed to God, to proper worship. And also, uh, fornication in Bible represents illicit 
spiritually illicit improper relationship between people of God and the world. So here we have apostate church. We have false system of worship that is in the church is supposed to be married to Christ. Christ is the bridegroom, but the church is in a relationship with the world, with the kings of this world and merchants and so on. So this is because of these false teachings and because of this illicit relationship, this uh, system is called Babylon and it's condemned by God and people are called to leave Babylon, to come out of Babylon. So Babylon is a symbol of confused religious system based on traditions of men rather than clear teachings of God's word. God in his word gives us the truths of the scriptures. She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this is, this is the contemporary modern religious apostate system. They do not follow the teachings of the word of God, but they follow the traditions of men. And Jesus said, in vain they worship me, teachings for the commandments of my, my, uh, God, the doc uh, doctrines of man. So this is the, this fornication. In John 17, 17, God says, sanct Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the people of God, remnant people of God, they keep the word of God as a truth. The truth is there. So let me just briefly review the first angel's message once again before I go to the third angel's message. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on, earth, on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Universal message, everlasting gospel. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and waters. So you have these all important truths for the end time in the first angel's message. But then let's read the third angel's message. Revelation 4, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship who? The beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So you see, the third angel's message is a warning against false worship. First angel's message is invitation called to worship through God, to worship God the Creator, to give glory to Him, to fear Him, to obey Him, to love Him, to accept the gospel. The third angel is warning against worshiping the beast and his image and receiving his mark. In these presentations, I cannot presentation, I cannot go into details of, of the of the beast and the mark and the image. I presented it recently in another meeting, but please remember the third angel's message is a warning against the false worship. So we have a true worship and we have the false worship. Those who worship the beast, what will happen? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So those who drink from the cup of Babylon, that, uh, that wine of fornication, that false, these false doctrines and teachings, they will be receiving, they will they shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured without mixture into a cup of this. So God is threatening. And the most terrible threatenings in the Bible are recorded here. But what is very interesting, if you don't want to worship the beast, we are having people who don't worship the beast. And how are they described in the book of Revelation? In verse 12, let's read together. Here is the patience of the saints, or endurance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So people who do not receive the mark, who do not worship the beast, or, who do, or his image, or who do not receive the mark of the beast, they are distinguished by what? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So these are the people who do not worship the beast or receive his mark. People who keep the commandments. So you see the difference true worshipers. So there are only two classes of worshipers at the very end of the world. Revelation 14, 7 tells us, worship the creator, first angel's message. Revelation 14, 9, don't worship the beast. And now Revelation 14, 12 tells us, keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. So you can see clearly there are only two types of worship, worshiping the creator God, keeping his commandments, or worshiping the beast and keeping the beast commandments. And this is how the whole world will be divided at the very end. So God's end time message warns us against the devil's deceptions in the last day. It's a call to true worship. 
Remember, brethren, dear friends, that the worship was always an issue from the very beginning. The first two brothers, Cain and Abel, they got into conflict and ultimately Cain killed his brother Abel because of worship. Because Abel worshipped the way how God commanded, bringing the lamb, and Cain simply disregarded God's command and did his way. He did it his own way. God did not accept it. He was angry, killed his brother. And the worship will be an issue until the very end of age. The final, the great controversy will end with this conflict over the worship. Who do we worship? God the Creator? Do we love Him? Do we keep His commandments in the hour of judgment? Or do we worship the beast and receive His mark? And this test was will be repeated. It was faced by three, by Hebrew people in the Babylonian captivity when King Nebuchadnezzar made that golden statue, golden image, and commanded everyone to bow down when the music would play. Everyone had to worship the golden image. But three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood upright. They were faithful to the true God, Jehovah, who is the creator. Even when they faced fiery furnace, they remained faithful to God. They knew and they told the king, King, let it be known to you, we, there is a God in heaven who can deliver us even from this fiery furnace. But even if he would not, we will not bow down and worship thy image. So brothers and sisters, these are the three angels' messages. There will be a test. It's coming. It's not far away. We should prepare today by knowing these three messages in our personal lives. We should today study these messages, understand their essence, and pray to God to give us ability to communicate to this world which is simply going in the wrong direction. Remember the plane, plane going down, engines not working, it will crash. We see the world in which direction it's moving right now. We see natural disaster, we see the wars, we see civil unrest, injustice, and so on. P people are desperate. People are looking for direction. And we have the message. We can give them direction. We can give them the hope. Because the book of Revelation gives us the hope. Jesus is coming soon. He is coming glorious. The death will, there will be not a, a night without a morning. There is a resurrection morning. There is a light at the end of this dreary night. God is calling us today to preach this message. And it is an appeal to surrender completely to God and commit our lives to following his truth. May this be our experience today, not only to know these three angels' messages, but to lovingly, reverently, humbly share it with those who do not know, that they may experience Jesus' presence in their lives, that the Holy Spirit may come upon us, that we may be enlightened people, that we can go in the whole world and invite people to worship through God Creator, because he loves us so much, and he gave us the greatest evidence of this love. He gave us his dear son, who is our high priest and who will so soon be our king and who will come in the clouds of heaven. And we hope and we trust that we will be among the, those who will greet him by saying, this is our God for whom we have waited and he will save us. May he save us all. Amen. Let us pray as we close this service. Loving and gracious Father in heaven, we thank you so much for opening our minds to understand the mysteries and the secrets of the Holy Book. You have given us the book of Revelation and Daniel and the whole Bible that we may know where are we in the stream of time. Oh, may this precious truth illumine our minds and warm our hearts. Oh, Lord, help us that we can ably communicate this message to this world that is without chart or and, and, and compass, drifting on the sea, Lord, help us to know this truth, to make Jesus our personal Savior. May we, Lord, reach to this world that as many as possible would be saved and protected and ready for your soon coming. Do come, Lord Jesus Christ, and save us and forgive us our sins. We ask all these things and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for being with us for this hour. We are happy that we could share this precious truth with you and invite you to the next presentations 
that will be presented next Sabbath by Pastor Marian uh, uh, Dorin Burke. And this message will be dealing with the topic of uh, how to communicate the message that we know by word. So we invite you to join us uh, next Sabbath as well at 4 p.m. And uh, may the Lord enable us to be his true and faithful witnesses. Amen. <laughs>